All right, listen, I'm so excited. Week number four of Everything Looks Better on Facebook, but this is real life. You know what I'm talking about. Everything looks better on Facebook. I was scrolling through Facebook the other day, and I saw this shirt, and I was like, I've got to have that shirt. That thing is sweet. And so I bought this shirt. You got to save the chubby unicorns. Here's the problem, though. It looked fantastic online. The problem is I get it, and now it's crooked and off-centered because everything looks better. Even what you're trying to buy, everything looks better on Facebook. But this is real life. And so we are in week number four of this series. And just kind of step back and remind us of where we've been Um, Week number one, we looked at Ecclesiastes 5, and you remember what it says. It says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. That there is a satisfaction that we are trying to gain. That every single day we are waking up and we desire to be satisfied. We desire to find fulfillment. We desire to find, um, you know, our purpose in life. And a lot of times we think that the more we get, the more we, we gain, The more we achieve, the more we accomplish, the more that's in our savings account, the more that's in our bank account, we feel like, man, then I'll be satisfied. And the problem is, the more we get, we still find there's this emptiness inside of us. And we find that we're still missing something. And so we go and we buy more. And we look at our neighbors and we see our neighbors buying new stuff. And we see our neighbors get new cars, so we feel like we should get a new car. They go get a bigger house and we feel like we need a bigger house. They get new clothes and we feel like we've got to keep up. And we're trying to keep up with everybody around us. And we're trying to match what they do. And what we have to remember is that God's love is not based on the number of zeros in your savings account. God doesn't love you because you have money or you don't have money. God's love is not based on the value of your bank account. And so what we have to remember is God's love has been proven to you and shown to you by his son, Jesus. He has already given you everything that he could possibly give you. There is nothing more valuable. There is no greater love and way for God to show you that he loves you than by giving what he's already given you, his son, Jesus. And so God loves you not based on how much money you have. Here's the thing. Your calling determines your zeros. Not, your, not God's love for you. My calling, I understand as a pastor, this church right here will never pay me millions of dollars to be their pastor, ever. I understand that. I know what God has called me to and my calling does not have millions and millions of dollars. Other people though, your calling that God has placed on your life is going to carry a bigger check. But that doesn't mean that God loves me less than he loves you. Your calling determines your zeros, not God's love for you. And so that's what we looked at. And then we just looked at no matter the amount of zeros we have, does our money reflect our love for God? And are we being obedient with what God has entrusted to us, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot? And are we telling God that even though I might have a little, I still trust you. And I trust you to take care of us as a family. Or even though I may have a lot, God, I'm going to trust you that I'm giving a lot and this is what I'm supposed to do and I trust you. And so God's just calling us to say who's number one on our heart. And a lot of times in order to figure that out, he has to go through our wallet. And so that's what we looked at week one. Week two, we looked at our kids and we looked at raising our kids and we looked at the fact that a lot of times for us as parents, our kids are driving our schedule and our kids are determining who we are and what we do. And we are going from one sporting event to the next sporting event. We've got baseball, we've got soccer, we've got football, we've got basketball, we've got gymnastics, we've got cheerleading, we've got these academic things that are going on. We've got band practice, we've got instrument practice, we've got all this stuff and we are trying to get our kids involved in doing everything. And then on top of that, we have parties that we've got to take our kids to and we've got to get them and we've got to get them there and we've got to make sure that they're at all the right things. Because we don't want our kids to be losers. And so we make sure that they're at all the right things, doing all the right things. And then here's the problem a lot of times. Sunday rolls around and we look at each other like, let's just take a break. Man, we have been running crazy. 
This week has been nuts. We don't have any time. We haven't been home at all. Let's just stay home from church. Let's sleep in. Let's cook breakfast. Let's just have breakfast as a family and just kind of relax, watch movies, and do nothing today and miss church. And the problem is what we're telling our kids is what we value is this over here. And this is what's important. And Jesus, he'll fit in wherever he fits in. And when we feel like it, when we want to, he can be a part. But when we're tired and we don't have any time, then we'll just miss out on him. But we're definitely not missing sports. We're definitely not missing school. We're definitely not missing these academic. We're definitely not missing these parties. And so we have to understand and we have to see that the children that we are raising are being shaped and molded today and becoming who you are creating them to be. And you are creating arrows that are going to be sent out into the world that are either going to have a godly impact or you're going to look at their, their life in 20 years and you're going to wonder, why don't they go to church? Why, are, why aren't they in church? And, and the problem is, is because the way that we raised them, we said, this is what's valuable, this is what's not. This is what means a lot to us, this is what doesn't. Because what you spend time on is what you value. And they see what you spend time on. And so they are in their mind wanting to please you with everything that's inside of them. I saw a study and it said that kids these days, they have one desire and that's to please their parents more than anything. And then as they grow older, that grows into trying to please their friends. But right now what they're trying to do is they want to please you. So they're looking at what you value and that's what they're valuing because you value it. And so what are you valuing in front of your kids? Who are they becoming? And then last week, we looked at our marriage. And we looked at the fact of, uh, that God is calling us not to just stay in a marriage. Because a lot of us, we feel that way. We won't use the D word. It's not coming up. Like, there's no way. We're not getting divorced as a husband and wife. We will, but we're miserable as, you know, can be. Like, we can't stand each other. We walk into the house. We go separate directions. We don't even look at each other. We've stopped talking to each other. But at least we won't get divorced. And we feel like God is saying, man, that's awesome. Thank you for just sticking it out. Thank you for having a miserable life, but at least staying together. You know, th thank you for not giving up. When really, even though you're in the house, you've already given up and you're already done. See, listen, God's desire for you is not to just not get a divorce and to just survive marriage. God's desire for you is to thrive in marriage. And the way that you do that is if you will love God with all of your heart, then you can't help but love your spouse. If you will go after God, like if your marriage is struggling and your marriage is not what you wanted it to be, then what you need to do is you need to go after God with all of your heart. See, because the problem is people come into our office and they sit down with Heather and I and they say, our marriage is struggling. We don't know what to do. We tell them what they don't want to hear. You need to spend more time reading your Bible. You need to spend more time on your knees. Like you don't need to try and fix this. You need to try and fix this. And then this will get better. If you will work on this, then this, it's a byproduct, and it's going to be great. And so when you are in a rut in your marriage, you need to focus on Jesus, and you need to go after him. And so today, we're in the final week of Everything Looks Better on Facebook, but this is real life. But starting next week, we're starting a brand new series, and it's called The War Within. And I'm excited about this series because this is going to deal with the mind and the battle of the mind for us. Because the more and more Heather and I are having conversations with people um, who are struggling mentally, struggling with depression, struggling with thoughts of suicide, struggling with thoughts of worthlessness and hopelessness, struggling with thoughts of fear, struggling with worry, and they've got this battle inside their mind that maybe they might not be expressing to everybody else, but they are struggling in their mind. And they are fighting hard, just trying to survive every single day. And just like your marriage, God did not create you to just survive. He wants you to have a thriving life. And he wants you to be all that he's created you to be. And so we're going to go to scripture and we're going to look and we're going to see what does the Bible say about these mental issues that are between our ears 
that we struggle with so often, but yet we rarely talk about. And we're really going to battle, and we're really going to have just some honest conversation and really seek out what God desires for us as a church. But today, if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 6, and here's what I would encourage you to do. Listen, bring your Bible with you, because this for me, there's a lot of things I can leave my children when I die. There are legacies, there are gifts that I'm going to be able to leave my kids. There are finances that I'm going to be able to leave my kids. There are house and cars that I'm going to be able to leave my kids. But the most important thing to me that I'm leaving my kids is right here. And here's the thing, this is what they're able to open up and they're able to see what was God saying to my dad? Well, how was God speaking to him? And so just coming to church, listen, I have multiple Bibles um, from many, many years, and I've got Bibles that are just filled just like this with my notes from preaching that are in there that they're going to be able to see. But then I have Bibles that I use for my quiet time personally. When I get up in the morning and when I open the scripture and when I begin to read, I'm taking notes and I'm writing down, this is what the spirit of God is speaking to me this morning. This is what he's saying. And they are going to be able to hold these things after I'm gone. Because listen, I'm dying. Like that's the bottom line. My life is not, I'm not getting healthier. I'm on the downhill slide. The bottom line is when I came out of my mother's womb, I started a downhill slide towards death. So did you, okay? Just to build you up and encourage you, okay? <laughs> Leave this place today just filled, you know, encouraged and built up. You're dying, okay? <laughs> but that's the bottom line. We're all dying. And so I want to leave a legacy. And I want to leave the right legacy for my kids. And so take notes, Sit here and see, what does the Spirit of God say to you through the passage? And so, as we're opening the Word of God today, Luke chapter 6, we're starting in verse 6, and it says this, On another Sabbath day, a man with a deformed right hand was in front of the, was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. And if he healed the man's hand, They had planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward. And then Jesus said to the critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day of doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or is this a day to destroy a life? And he looked around the room at them one by one. And he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. I want to look at six things today from this passage. The first one is this, on the Sabbath. See, what was taking place and what you have to understand is the Sabbath was different than the way that we view it today. In the Old Testament law, what they had described and what they wanted people to do, what the law said is you were not allowed to work at all on the Sabbath. And so basically all your meal prep, everything that you needed to do with your animals, everything that you needed to do in your house, they wanted one day of complete and total rest. And so you could not do anything. And if you did, you broke God's law and you broke the law of that day. And so people would prepare their meals beforehand and they would eat those. People would take extra food to their animals so they didn't have to feed them all day. The house did not get cleaned. They did not, they rested on the Sabbath. And so on this day, people are following Jesus and Jesus is standing up having conversations with people. And as he's teaching and as he's communicating, nobody expected any work or anything like that to be done because it was the Sabbath. And so nobody was expecting Jesus to do anything. And I think a lot of times this is the way that we are. A lot of times we walk through the doors of the church and it's just another day and we don't come in with great anticipation of what God is going to do and how God is going to work and how God is going to stir 
Because what we do is we get in a routine. And that routine dictates what we do. And so in that routine, if it's not blocked off and if there's not time created, then a lot of times it doesn't happen. For me, I know my day is scheduled out from beginning to end. I know when I get up, I look at my calendar and and I know what I have. I know what meetings, I know where I'm going, I know who I'm meeting with, I know what I'm doing. Even to do message prep, that is blocked off. For me to sit down and, and to start praying over scripture and seeing where God is leading me. And so everything is scheduled. And I think probably, I I think possibly some of the greatest moments in life are those unexpected, unscheduled moments. Those moments that aren't necessarily in the calendar and the spirit of God begins to stir conversations as you're just standing there. You were just going into Starbucks to get a coffee, but now all of a sudden you're having deep conversations with somebody about their relationship with the Lord. You were just going in to get a hamburger, but all of a sudden you're praying over somebody and you're praying over their life. You were just walking through Walmart and you came around the corner and there was somebody standing right there and they just begin telling you, hey, can you pray for me? This is what's going on. And all of a sudden, what wasn't scheduled now becomes some of the greatest moments in your life. And here's what happened to me. One of those moments took place when I was a youth pastor. I got a phone call um, from the BGCO, the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma. And they called me and they said, will you take a group of students from around the state from multiple different youth groups to Washington, D.C.? And will you lead them on this mission trip as they go help church planners? No, I'm not interested. Heather's like, I think you should. And she's the one that really dictates my schedule. So I said, okay. (laughs) And so I said, yes, I will. And so I took this group of students of about 60 kids to Washington, D.C. And we were there and we were working with church planners. The crazy thing is, I had people speaking into my life saying, Johnny, I think you're a church planner. And I would tell them, nope, those guys are crazy. I can't do that. That's hard. I want a church that already has people, that already has a building, and that already has a budget. That would just be a good starting point. But you want me to start something from nothing. You want me to work with no money, and you want me to have no people to do this. Those people are crazy. And so I was going to Washington, D.C., taking students to help church planners. And so that's what they were calling me to do. And so we went down there. We were helping multiple different church planners. (laughs) But while we're down there, All of a sudden, one of the pastors there, he's like, hey, Sunday's coming. Let's go to Mark Batterson's church, National Community Church in Washington, D.C. The room's not much bigger than this. It looks a lot like this. And we brought 60 people into the room like this. And so you can imagine, they have a full room already, and now 60 people on top of that coming in. Well, as we got off the train and we are walking down the sidewalk and heading to Mark Batterson's church, we see tables and music set up outside the church. And they are handing out donuts, they're handing out orange juice, they're handing out coffee to just people as they go by. Not people that are coming in the church, people that are just walking by. This is blowing my mind. That's not what the church does. The church only gives donuts to people who are willing to come through the doors of the church. That's the special privilege of church. If you come to church, we'll give you a not to just walk by. It's like, that is not good budget use at all. And so I was blown away. I was like, man, this is thinking outside the box, being nice to people. <laughs> That's weird. And so I, I, we walk in and it's just, it's an incredible environment because when you walked in, people actually wanted to be there. They were smiling. They were nice. They were kind. And we had this idea of church from being around some people and being around some churches that when you walk through the doors of the church, you weren't supposed to be happy. You weren't supposed to like what was going on. You were just supposed to go because it's Sunday. And so it's Sunday, so you go to church and you don't have to smile. You just have to be there and you check it off the box and you go home. But these people are actually enjoying what's taking place and what's going on. And I couldn't believe it. And so we're sitting there, I don't remember I I remember like the band wasn't just something that is just incredible. And I'm like, oh my goodness, they need to make a CD. Like it wasn't anything like that. Like they were good and we had great worship. And then Mark got up and I can't remember what Mark Batterson preached about, 
But I, I, all I know is sitting in that chair, all of a sudden the spirit of God began to work in me and began to stir in me. That Johnny, this is what I desire for church to be. This is what I want people to feel. I want people to enjoy walking through the doors of the church. I, I, I want people to get excited that it's Sunday. I, I want to love people even though they don't walk through the doors of the church, even though they will never come. I, I still want us as the church to love them. I, I want people to get a sense that, man, when the service is over, they're disappointed because they've got to wait seven more days for it to begin again. Not because of me preaching, but because of the atmosphere and the spirit that God is building and the community that God is building right here in this church. And I'm sitting in the seat in a room like this, and you can imagine, I lose it. And he's preaching, and I'm sitting in the chair. <laughs> All the kids are looking at me, and they're just thinking, like, what is, like, I, I realize I tell you a lot of stories about me crying. I'm not an emotional guy. Like, you can punch me, and I will not cry. Uh, I'm tough. <laughs> I just, like, as I'm saying it, I'm like, I cry a lot. This is weird. Suck it up. And so I was sitting there. I wasn't crying. I was sitting there, like, manly. And as I'm sitting there, God just impresses on my heart that this is a calling in the direction that I have for you. And I came home and told Heather, and a year later, we decided to start the church. And now, four and a half years later, we have a building and we see almost 500 people walk through the doors of the church every single week because of this. It's those unexpected moments of a God encounter that we hadn't planned and we hadn't expected. Could it be that we need to start expecting God to do great things even when it's unplanned and it's not in our schedule? Could it be that we need to start looking through life not through the lens of this schedule and having to get places and be places and do things and start looking through life and saying, God, use me, speak to me no matter where I'm at, no matter what's going on. Interrupt my life with God-changing moments. God, let me be used by you, not to fit into a schedule, but just to be used by you to love on people. It was Sunday. Nobody expected Jesus to do anything because you weren't supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. But Jesus had other plans. See, listen, your schedule may not fit the plans that Jesus has for you. And you've got to be okay with that. If you want God doing something great in your life, then let him interrupt your schedule and let him start dictating your schedule. And even though you may be busy and even though you may need to get somewhere and even though it may make you late, listen, it's okay because those God moments are worth every bit of lateness and an interruption in the schedule. And so Jesus on the Sabbath was fixing to do something incredible. And the second thing we see is this in the room. Uh, right here, it says this, on the Sabbath, a man with a deformed right hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but you've ever felt out of place in a room and you felt like everybody else in the room deserves to be in the room, but somehow you're in the room and you shouldn't be. Like you feel like, I kind of snuck in. I hope nobody notices <laughs> Like, I don't think I should be here. Like, I mean, I know I'm here, but please nobody really just call me out because I feel like I should be on the outside of the room looking in. I got that when we started the church early on. I got a call from a guy and he said, hey, I'm getting some pastors together in the area. We're going to talk about some things and just how the church can better come together and, and make an impact on the area. So I said, sure. I walk into the room and we are a brand new church. We are running like less than a hundred people. And I am a brand new pastor, have no clue what I'm doing. And I am in the room with guys who are running 20,000 people on the weekend. And they are asking questions to these pastors. And I'm sitting there and I will not speak up because I felt uncomfortable. I was like, I don't deserve to be in this room. Like I have nothing good to offer. Like I am barely trying to keep the doors open, not thinking about how to make an impact on the community. I just want to make sure we have church next week. Like that's it. 
Like, I don't have any budget money to give to anybody. Like, we're, we're already tight as it is. I'm investing my savings. I'm cashing in my 401k. Like, what am I doing in this room? And there's a man standing in the back of the synagogue with a deformed hand. And in the room with Jesus are scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, political people, people who have a lot of money, and people of great importance. And then there's a man standing in the back of the room with a deformed hand. See, I think what we feel like a lot of times when we look at Scripture and when we go before God is we feel like there's a lot of people in front of us that God should bless and that God should heal, and we find ourselves in the back of the room. We find ourselves when we pray and ask God, we are praying prayers of God, if you have anything left over, would you please just give me some? If you have any healing left, would you give it to me? Because here's the problem. We don't even value our own selves. And if we don't value our own selves, we don't feel like God can value us. And if I don't value me, then why is God going to value me? I can't even value myself. I don't even feel like I deserve to be in the presence of God. There's a lot of other people that should be standing in the front of the line. I need to be way at the back. I'm just glad to be in the room. At least I get to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And that's how we feel a lot of times. When we come before him and we get on our knees and we begin to pray, we don't value ourselves. And so we don't think that God should truly value us. Although we're trying to speak these words, we're trying to say some things. God, I, I need you to show up in this area if you have time for me. I need you to help me if that's okay. I, I, I need you to move in this area if you don't mind. And we approach God like we are disrupting and interrupting who he is. And as we approach God, we feel like, okay, I, I don't want to make you mad. Like, please don't be mad that I'm talking to you. Please don't be mad that I'm coming before you. I know there's other people that are praying that are a lot more important than me, but God, please, just may I have a little bit, like if there's any crumbs around the table, I'll take those. And, and that's how we approach God a lot of times with our prayer. Because what we do is we feel like other people don't value us because you don't feel valued because you feel like my job isn't that important. And my job isn't that important, and I've got a bad position in my job, so I must not have that much value to people. And if people don't value me, then God definitely doesn't value me. And if people don't care about me, then God definitely doesn't care about me. And if people don't believe in me, then God definitely doesn't believe in me. Nobody's picking up the phone and calling me and asking me for my opinion in different areas. So if people aren't valuing me, then how in the world does the God of the universe value me? I'm just glad at least to be in the room. I'm not going to ask and pray any big, crazy prayers. I'm not going to think God's going to use me in a big, crazy way because people don't even value me. I don't even value me. So how does God value me? And that's the approach we take a lot of times in life. It's like, you know, really getting picked last in elementary when you're out there and you're standing on the playground and everybody's so much fun. And then there's two captains, two team captains, and everybody wants to be the team captain, but you're never the team captain. And you're standing in line and you start looking down the line. You're like, I'm definitely better than you. Definitely faster than you. I can definitely catch better than you. Oh, they definitely like me more than you. And then all of a sudden they start picking and you're still standing there. Better than you. And then all of a sudden, you're still standing there. And that feeling right there in that moment follows you for the rest of your life. And you feel like nobody values you. And you feel like nobody cares. And if nobody cares, then God doesn't care. And so now all of a sudden you're living life in a defeated mindset, even though you don't mean to. You don't want to live defeated. You don't want to live with this mindset of defeat. But you feel this way because you always feel left out. I should have a better job, but nobody values me. I should be able to have this position, but nobody cares. I should be able to do this, but, but nobody values me. I'm not good enough. God doesn't want to hear my prayers. God doesn't care about me. And so now all of a sudden you start living life from the back of the room and you're just in the room. 
You're not a part of the room. You're just in that moment, but you're not really a part. And so then the next thing we see is it was in the hands of Jesus. Here's the thing. In their head, I'm sorry, in their head, number three, Jesus knew the thoughts of the people in the room. There's a guy in the back of the room, and he's got a shriveled up hand. And he's hiding it. He's in a room, uncomfortable with everybody around him. And then all these people that feel like they deserve to be in the room begin to think, I want to catch Jesus inside. They hated Jesus. And they did everything they could in order to trap him, in order to get him to do something so that then they could throw him under the bus and his character and his ministry was done. Because that's what people want to do. People want to trap you and people want to destroy what Jesus is trying to do in your life. Like I have people, pastors speaking into my life on a weekly basis. Johnny, where are you here? How are you? The enemy is coming after you and he wants to destroy what God's trying to do. Are you good? Yeah. Okay. Because why? The enemy's looking for any area to step in and destroy your life and destroy your ministry and destroy the work that God is trying to do at your work, in your marriage, in your family, with your friends, with your neighbors. And all it takes is one moment of your neighbors doing something dumb and you're yelling at them. (sighs) Can't believe you put up a fence like that. The the code, you know, in the neighborhood says you have to have your fence facing the other way. You can't have all that two by four facing out. It has to be facing in. So change it. And all of a sudden, you being rude and a jerk, one moment changes your relationship with them and doesn't give you an opportunity to have the right relationship. My neighbor knocked on my door um, Friday night. We were at home not doing anything. and Early Friday morning, I'm sorry. Knocked on my door early Friday morning, and I opened the door, and she's like, hey, I just want you to know we're adopting our grandson, and it's final today, and we're having a party tonight, and we would love for you to come because of the influence and the impact you've had on his life. I don't do anything. We play basketball together out in the driveway sometimes. He comes over. That's it. But if I was rude every time he walks out the door, get off my yard. I have those weeds there for a purpose. Quit stepping on them. They wouldn't invite me over. But that's what we do a lot of time. You See, you have to understand Jesus... He, he knew the thoughts of the people in the room. See, here's the incredible thing is what you think is hidden up here and what you think is private and nobody knows and what you think you're struggling with or, or what, you know, some of the sin issues that you have between your ears that you are, would never tell anybody. Here's what you have to know. God knows and God still chooses to love you. God knows those deep, dark secrets that you won't tell anybody. Those things where you're sitting out there and you won't tell your wife, but you're sitting there and you're just like, Johnny's a dork. Like, I can't say that about a pastor, but I think he is. And you would never tell anybody that, but you think these things and you would never say it. And there's things that goes on in the mind. And in spite of that, God still looks down and God says, I love you in spite of that. It's not where God wants you to stay, but he loves you. And so in the room, the people are thinking some things. And so Jesus does something. And thought number four, in the back, in the back of the room, there's a man standing with a shriveled hand. And Jesus looks at him and he says, hey, come up front in front of everybody. This is the man that's trying to hide. This is the man that doesn't feel like he fits in. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is calling him out to come forward. Remember, this is the guy that felt like there is a line in order to get to Jesus, and he doesn't even get to stand in it. Like, I'm not even good enough to be at the back of the line. I don't even deserve this. And now all of a sudden, Jesus, knowing the thoughts of the man, he says, hey, come here. Come up front. Me? Yeah. See, here's the problem. A lot of us are coming through the doors of the church and we sit at the back because we're trying to hide. See, I did this in high school. And maybe it's not the back, but maybe we just walk through the doors and we try and hide. I I did this in high school. When we were in high school and I got to choose where I wanted to sit, I would go sit in the back of the room and I would take my book and I would hold it up like this and I would never make eye contact with the teacher. 
because I did not want them calling on me. I didn't want to answer any questions. I definitely didn't want to read anything. I, I just wanted to get through class. That's it. Leave me alone. And so I would hold the book up and I would keep my head down and I, I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't, you know, try and bring attention to me. I, I didn't, because I didn't want to be called out. And I think that's what we're doing a lot of times in church is we're walking through the doors of the church and we're wasting our gifts that God has given us to use. See, here's the thing. A lot of us just think that, Johnny, you need to stand up and preach. You need to stand up and lead the church. But what you don't understand is that in order for God to take us where he wants to take us, you have to use your gifts. You have to. If you don't use your gifts, we can't become all that God has called us to be as a church. We've got a Saturday night service. We need more volunteers. We've got a 9 a.m. service. We need more volunteers. We've got an 11. We need more volunteers. We don't have enough people to do all that God has called us to do. And every single week, when we sit down and we have staff meeting, one of the things that we talk about is how do we get more people involved? How do we get more people to serve? Because we've got people right now who are serving and they're doing everything. We've got people who are serving two services. We've got people who are serving all three services. We've got people who are just getting worn out because they are carrying all of the load. And they know that we need them in order to accomplish what God has called us to do. But at some point, the church has got to step from the back and move forward and let God use us in a way that may make us uncomfortable. Because he pulled that guy from the back to the front. And he said, I want everybody to see you use what I'm going to do through you. And God's wanting to use your gifts and your talents and your abilities in order to bring life change to people. God's wanting you to step out from the back. And it